Judge Janine getting an exclusive interview with Daniel Penny's attorney. The Marine facing a second-degree manslaughter charge in the chokehold death of homeless vagrant Jordan Neely on a New York City subway. Daniel's attorney, Steve Razor, sharing the Marine side of the story for the first time and explaining why Penny stepped in. What was his mindset when he put Jordan Neely in a chokehold? Well, the mindset is pretty simple. Uh, he was fearful for the safety of those passengers. So when he acted, his mindset was to keep his fellow passengers safe from attack, nearly entering the train and acting in a very violent manner, um, both physically and with words. He would say things to the effect that, um, you know, I need certain things, I need food, I need this or that, and if I don't get it, I don't care if I go to prison for the rest of my life. And the passengers actually have said that they interpreted that mean, well, when would you go to prison for the rest of your life? if you kill somebody. So everybody got the message. There was a period of time where the situation kind of developed. So, uh, you know, a period of time to be able to observe Mr. Neely, um, you know, swinging his arms at passengers, throwing his jacket down, um, making threats. Penny is an attorney say they have fully cooperated with radical DA Alvin Bragg and were caught off guard by the charges. How did you find out about the charges? Well, we were told that uh, there was going to be a grand jury presentation and that that would take some time and it was going to be a very kind of a deliberate process. Uh, it was not going to be uh, rushed. Then suddenly uh, we got a, a call um, one night before uh, Danny was asked to surrender and said he's, he's got he's to surrender to the police department tomorrow. So at that point, we're, what do you mean tomorrow? This was going to be a long process. Suddenly it's tomorrow. Penny's attorney pushing back on the attacks that former pres former Marine response was racially motivated. Daniel has been called a murderer by some, a vigilante by others. Many claim that he, he acted based on race. What do you say to those people? None of that is based on the facts. Um, as, to, as to race, uh, it's simply not the motivation for Danny. He is the one that put himself in danger to save who? All the people on that train, the black people, brown people, white people, it didn't matter to Danny. Danny put his life at risk to save all those people. It has nothing to do with race. And so, Judge, nice job with the attorney there. When he told you that witnesses on that subway felt that they were in danger for losing their lives, what, what will that mean for the actual trial? Everything. If this grand jury makes a decision to return a true bill, which is an indictment, and I suspect that's what's going to happen on the return date of July 17th, uh, if they return an indictment, that means everything, because it's whether or not Dan, Daniel Pe uh, Penny was reasonable in light of the circumstances. And the circumstances are based upon what Steve Razor, the attorney, described. He said, we were underground, we were in a car, some people had self-service, some didn't. They were trying to call the police. People were moving away. They were afraid. And he said there was nothing that anyone could do. This guy, as you heard him just say, was willing to die. Uh, and he was willing to go to prison for the rest of his life. So uh, all of this is about reasonableness based upon not one thing, but the whole totality of circumstances and whether or not Daniel Petty acted reasonably. Now, the, the interesting thing is when I asked him a question about, he's been arrested 44 times, uh, Jordan Neely. He said, you know, whether he knew that or didn't know that didn't matter. What mattered was what he felt in that car, in that moment when no one was, could escape and when no police could get in. And the fact that people actually came out afterwards and thanked him for helping them indicates that there was a great deal of fear on the part of people in that car. And by the way, you know the interesting thing? Today I was talking to someone and they said, I was on that same train that day and we had a crazy person in our train car and we were calling the police and we were like, great, they stopped the train, the police were coming. He said, but they went to a different car. He said, they didn't come to my car. So think about the jury. If this is a Manhattan jury, New York City juries know what it's like to be on a subway. I wonder what changed in Bragg's office because they were cooperating and all of a sudden like that, something flipped. Do you think public pressure played any role? 
Uh, well, Andy McCarthy, who I had on earlier, did a great piece uh, on, in the National Review today where he just talks about the political nature of what's going on in New York and that it, you, you cannot have, you know, this is not a justice system where it's based on the facts of the case and whether or not he should pursue it. And clearly he jumped the gun because people were jumping down into the subway and protesting all over the place and screaming in the faces of police officers. I'm not sure why they were doing that because the police didn't have anything to do with this situation. They got there in six minutes to try to help. So, um, you know, th this is going to be very, very, very interesting, this case. And this young man acted, you know, spontaneously based on what he understood about the situation. But I think it, it will come down and judge, you, you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, but to whether or not he had to restrain him in that way for the length of time that he did. Could he have restrained him in another way that wouldn't have caused his death? Well, I think it's going to be based on the circumstances, and we still don't have the complete autopsy report. Right. So we don't have the toxicology. I mean, it was a rush to get the autopsy report, a rush to issue a felony complaint when they were planning to go to the grand jury. It's a politicization and weaponization, again, by a progressive DA. And the Marine has raised somewhere above $2 million, Greg, for legal defense. Yeah, I don't know if that's enough uh, to fight a mob. I mean, right now... The left wants a George Floyd, but the world is seeing Kyle Rittenhouse. And the only reason why we're going to live through another high-tension case is because City Hall and Bragg caved to a handful of protesters. And I do think it was coordinated. I think that we, we you mentioned it, Jessica, how quiet it got before this mm -hmm. came down. And, and let's not forget, the protesters were standing on subway tracks. I mean, you got to be seriously crazy to do that unless you knew that it was turned off or nothing was going to happen. So they knew they they knew ahead of time. Um, so it raises this problem. What happens if the trial doesn't go b by the expectations of the protesters? This is what's happening. We are being extorted. Uh, this is the, the mob versus the money. He gets money for the defense, but the mob is saying, if you don't string him up, the city burns. Look, man, they, they did billions in damages post George Floyd for no reason at all. There was, there was a case going yeah. on. Nobody was trying to hurt anybody. Dozens of people died because of those riots. The city leaders let that happen. They gave it the okay. They said that it's justified. In this case, by leading these protesters on, they're, they're, they are creating another tinderbox. I'm gonna be out of this city well before that happens. <laughs> Did you learn anything from the interview with the attorney that we just saw there that you didn't know before? Um, well, obviously, insight into what he's been talking about with his client, what their defense will look like, and a more clear picture of what the day looked like. And I agree with Jesse. You did a wonderful jo job, Judge. Oh. Um, and I just find this case completely fascinating on every level, one of those where there's almost complete agreement between people. I haven't heard anyone say that Jordan Neely's death wasn't a tragedy, right? Or maybe yeah. a few jerks have, but nobody sane or that we would speak to on a normal basis has said, you know, this guy deserved to die. And every little drip of extra information that we get paints this picture of a Marine who acted, who then tried to ensure his safety afterwards. We know that he was breathing when he let go of the chokehold from the video and that he put him into the recovery position. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, really changed the way that I view this, to know that this was someone who was clearly felt like he was protecting people and he had assistance, right? And I still don't know, um, and maybe it's in the full interview, why mm -hmm. no one else was charged with anything because there were three people that were helping him right. in all of this. They haven't been charged. They right. have not. And I find that strange, and I wonder if something will come of that. Um, but Greg, when you said people wanted this to be George Floyd, I literally have it written down here that it, it just isn't. And I think it's telling to see $2 million plus in Daniel Penny's fund and only a little bit over 100K in the Jordan Neely fund. You know, people do give to these and they feel liberal, middle of the road, Republican, whatever it is, that they're not getting a full picture the portrayal of this as just a, a white law enforcement official got on a train and killed an innocent black man is not what this is. No. And the people are acting with their pocketbooks on that front. Yeah, it's got nothing to do with that. All right, if you want to see more of the judge's interview with Daniel Penny's attorney, you can go to foxnews.com right now.
or after the fuss. Hey everyone, I'm Emily Campagno. Catch me and my co-hosts Harris Faulkner and Kaylee McEnany on Outnumbered every weekday at 12 p.m. Eastern or set your DVR. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page for daily highlights.